to give you an example when i told my parents that i'm going to pakistan they had a very strong reaction they were like are you going to be safe i can imagine and uh, just before i was going to land in karachi news came in that riots had broken out Hi Sachin. Hi Krish. Thank you for being on this show with us. Great to be here and congratulations on doing this. Yeah, so this is the Real Voice podcast and I'm speaking today to Sachin Garg, a best-selling author, public speaker and entrepreneur. So you've done a lot and successfully so. And um today we're, you know, I'd love to talk about your new book which is The Hindu Refugee Camp Lahore. Um it was a great read. very interesting writing style the whole book is a series of letters from lovers across the border and um you know i i'd love to hear where your inspiration came from because it is based on a true story so i'd love to start there so i would say that uh, the inception of the idea came uh, when i went to pakistan a few years back and uh, i don't really come from a partition affected family directly although some might say that the whole country is partition affected uh so when i went to pakistan i didn't really have any thoughts about uh, pakistan as a political issue or whatever and uh, then i met a lot of interesting people and had a lot of interesting conversations there were a lot of things that um, i had only read about in newspapers and uh, seen people talk about those kind of things but when they happened with me when i saw how different things were from what i was expecting them to be to give you an example when i told my parents that i'm going to pakistan they had a very strong reaction they were like are you going to be safe i can imagine and uh, just before i was going to land in karachi news came in that riots had broken out uh, in karachi there was a the hazra community wanted some riot uh, some riots and uh, there were widespread violence in the city of karachi which made them even more apprehensive were you afraid um i was a little because uh, the riots were very close to the airport and uh, this was like there was internet on our phones but it was not that prevalent back then So I was a little worried because uh it's a different country we won't have our phones because we would have just landed and I was with a powerful very important delegation for the trip so there were going to be some very important people but as soon as I landed and the moment I came out of the airport I don't know if every Pakistani does it but whoever I met they wouldn't say hello and shake your hand they would come and hug you that <laughs> really that's wholesome that's so kind. yeah i would i met this uh, 55 year old man and he would just come and hug me so warmly and uh, i don't know if they do it with everybody but maybe they just wanted me to feel comfortable you just have a huggable huggable face oh, yes, <laughs> i think that is a compliment although i'm not sure so um yeah so they welcomed me and they said that okay this and this is happening so we are just going to be holed up in our hotel for your whole stay of karachi and we had around a day in karachi so i was a little worried that okay we are going to get bored in our hotel but they took good care of us fed us a lot told us stories told spoke about politics a lot about pakistani politics and what all was happening and uh, that was a lot of fun so i don't know how much i should tell you about my pakistan trip but a lot happened a lot of which directly and indirectly ended up me reaching the stage of writing this book mm. and uh, it sounds like there was there is a huge disparity in what we hear about pakistan and what def- actually happened most definitely so yeah. pakistan is a big country it might not be as big as india but it's still a big country and uh, when you actually land there and walk on the streets you realize that the common man on the road is exactly like somebody walking in sibopal right so the way we love sharukh khan for example they also love sharukh khan in who does it <laughs> in fact the way we love virat kohli also they love virat kohli as well in a very similar way and uh, i had heard stories that uh, when you buy something from a shop and if you tell them you're from india then they don't accept money and that actually happened with me in lahore that uh, i had chole bhature in lahore 
a lot of people have had chole bhature in amritsar but you need to have chole bhature in lahore as well and uh, absolutely loved them and the moment they heard i'm from india so nobody there was a punjabi pathan guy who was selling those chole bhature and he would just not accept money from me because i'm from india being from india is like uh, being a white man in bombay <laughs> It's like a, it's like I realize what white privilege must feel like when these guys travel to India. That they don't accept money; they treat you like you're somebody special, like you're a celebrity, just for 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 being from India. You know, I find it so interesting and ironic that you said that they love Virat Kohli because every time there's an India Pakistan match, and especially recently, there's been a lot of violence associated with. cricket all of a sudden so i think just hearing that you know you can appreciate good sportsmanship yeah i think that is something that is making me kind of enjoy cricket a little bit more um yeah pakistan is a very cricket loving country like in india our attention is somewhat divided between bollywood and cricket and even entrepreneurs now to some extent Pakistan does not have a film industry which is uh, as big as Bollywood or Telugu film industry or Malayalam film industry. They also the entrepreneurial ecosystem is also not as big as it is in India. So for them, cricket is like the major go-to conversation whenever five people are sitting together. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I can imagine, and I think I think that's that that's really nice to hear. Um. you just bringing it back to to your book and how it's based on a true story yeah yeah and so your trip to pakistan is essentially what kind of led you to discovering the story yes 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 so uh immediately after i came back uh, i got to hear about a live performance which was called uh, taqseem e hind okay it was a dastan goi performance do you know what's dastan goi dastan goi is when uh, two people just sit on the stage and they just tell you stories so it's a performance style it's a performance style it's oral storytelling it used to be very popular in india i would say 17th 18th 19th century beginning of 20th century it kind of died out then uh, some performers in northern india brought it back um, earlier this century around say 20 years back and now it's beginning to catch up and a lot of performers who are doing really well with dastan goi so i read about this dastan goi performance called taqseem e hind taqseem e hind translates to partition of india okay so i read about it and i just come back from pakistan so i was really interested in this subject i ended up going for that performance there were two performers ankit chadda uh, himanshu bajpai and ankit ended up becoming kind of a friend after that performance as well so they were told around say eight nine stories in that performance and uh, one of the stories was of a guy called Hawaldar Limfitter Gulam Ali okay and the moment i heard that story it kind of got stuck in my head okay after weeks and months of hearing that story it just got stuck in my head there were so many themes in that story there were so so many plot twists in that story a true story which was documented by a very uh, noted historian and um, it just kept coming back to me for months and years after i heard it and i reached a point that i just thought that i need to write it down i need to document it and i started researching about that story that's incredible that yeah. sounds almost like it was meant to be you yeah. and it re- really resonated with you yeah, absolutely what were some of the themes that really drew you in to the story i think the main theme of the book was that how politicians and powerful people use religion as a tool as a manipulation tool and a lot of them just say things they don't mean at all they actually don't believe in at all and for them maybe it's just a caste mathematics or religion mathematics that they are going by and in the process the common man who's really sentimental about his religion and just wants to pray to his god and uh, feel comfortable doing so how that kind of a person gets uh becomes like a pawn in this bigger game of chess being played by important people yeah getting caught up in the hypocrisy of it all yeah so in the book if you see like there are like five or six important characters in the book and this is the common theme for each character the main character is a guy who's a muslim who's an indian muslim from lucknow 
and after the partition he finds himself in lahore for some reason and he's struggling to come back to his own country but because he is a muslim and some of his paperwork was kind of messed up he's not able to come back to his motherland and uh, because of which he starts writing letters to indian authorities and and several things happen but he's not able to come back to his own country and he finds himself in a hindu refugee camp in lahore which was a real refugee camp in lahore set up by the rss interestingly after the after the partition um and uh, how religion just keeps affecting his life in various different ways and then there are other characters there's a pandit ji at the refugee camp there's a female lead in lucknow also a muslim uh, working in a government office in lucknow um uh, how just religion just uh, entangles the life of each of these characters is the main theme of the book yeah and permeates into love and friendships and i think love permeates everything right so i mean if there's love in a story is it's just more natural to pull in a reader and uh, get them interested in the story or at least in my writing love just permeates every story and every character it is a it is a prevalent theme in more than one book that you have uh, written and in fact when we met for the first time i was a little you know i remembered your your book that i read when i was younger it it stuck with me and i think it stuck with me because the larger theme of love across boundaries be it socio economical or you know nationalities that has been something that crops up Yes. In a couple of your of your books. Yes. And why do you think that theme is something that seems to that you seem to be engaging with that more often than not? So William Faulkner uh, in his Nobel uh, accepting speech he said that uh, a story is what happens when there's a conflict in the human heart. So when you talk about romance or when you talk about any kind of story actually so it's about what is the conflict in the human heart behind that story so for me uh, in the books that you're talking about uh, that is the conflict that there are these two characters and they are differentiating in this particular way uh, if we talk about the book that you mentioned i am not 24 so there's like a prim and proper b school grad girls doing her job in a very unusual space in a factory in northern karnataka and she is like always uh, done things by the book and then there is this guy who's a weed smoker and doesn't bathe in like weeks and who's like uh, wearing those harem pants and kurta and uh, smells badly and looks very unkempt and all that so i mean that's a very uh, conflicting world view in a way right for both of them so it makes for an interesting story for such two characters to come together So I think I just look at conflicting world views and how they clash and what happens when they clash and how it somehow seems to reflect some inner conflict as well that we all go through. Yeah, I think when I'm starting the story maybe I might not have the inner conflict and the story grows in the telling, right? So when you start telling and you deep dig deeper into the characters you discover that as well. So in your in your um in your book you mention that the story broke you. I did I did in the acknowledgments yeah. Yeah what what did you mean by that? I think uh, the the beginning and uh, the ending uh, like it took me around 4 or 5 years to write that book and uh, in that process it just took so many forms okay. to give you an analogy uh, i had started it, it writing uh, i'd started writing it in the form of same web series like a never ending character journeys which just goes on and on so in the earlier version of the book gulam ali was a character who had a whole arc and all the other five characters also had like a never ending arc they were just going they were going through their journeys there were like five more characters as well so it had reached uh, around 200000 words um, which is like say a thousand page book at one time and uh, luckily i realized that okay this is a waste of time for me and for the reader as well so i deleted like 80% of it just overnight 
and uh, I reached twenty thousand words, and I restarted the process of writing the book. Uh, just the kind of work which went into it, the emotional space, and like you mentioned, it's in the form of uh, a letter exchange between two characters. That made it so much tougher to write. I can only write what Gulam Ali is seeing or Zahira is seeing at a particular time. I can only write in a way that Gulam Ali will write. I can only stick to the facts that Zahira knows. And if Zahira is a working woman, Muslim woman in Lucknow in 1957, there are things she cannot know, there are things she cannot believe, which really restricts me what I can say about Lucknow. So the story might need something else, but I'm so restricted and all that. So all these things just made it... Like, I feel like I really took a Herculean task trying to write a book with so many limitations and so much research, trying to say so much in a book. And in the end, I think the pandemic kind of helped because it just silenced everything else, right? My work had come to a stop. My friends had stopped meeting me, obviously. I had no other option just to sit on my desk and just write this book. And there was no TV, there were no films, there was nothing happening during the pandemic. So that really helped in finishing me, finishing this book. Yeah, I I get what you're trying to say about putting yourself in, in their shoes at that time. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people who write say, you know, write what you know. Mm-hmm. But your Herculean task was writing something that you did have to do a lot of research for. And so how was there any process that led to you putting yourself in their shoes, in Zahira's shoes, in Bulam Ali's shoes, when you were writing with their lens? It was really difficult. And uh, one particular research thing which really helped me uh, so there's this series of books uh, which is called Greatest Hindi Stories Ever Told, Greatest Odia Stories Ever Told. Alice is a great publisher who publishes them. And it's a very sincerely done project. Like somebody has really gone out and found the greatest Urdu stories ever told, okay? And I think there are around 10 books in that series. And I read all of them. And... I think that was the turning point in my research because, for example, um, um, who's the writer of Lihaf? Isma Chukte. Isma Chukte once wrote a short story which is about abortions in 1930s and 40s before we had uh, medical procedures to do abortions. Okay, So what they used to do was, uh, she's written a short story called Tail Malish. So what Tail Malish is referring to is how women in India used Malish and fists and punching and all that as a way of abortion, way before medical science could uh, do abortions effectively. And that was a very gruesome way of doing it, and uh, which, ha- which led to a lot of complications and uh, all kind of terrible cases as well. And that kind of a nugget you can only get in a short story which was written in 1945, okay? Nobody can write that story in today's time. There is no documentation of uh, stuff like that, okay? For example, there was another story about how women at a wedding would just sit and talk and do banter about uh, all kind of things, even sexual things, just in, in an Indian home at a wedding, pulling each other's leg about... Uh, how your sass is nasty or how your husband is very, um, he has a roving eye and he would just stare at every woman going by and these kind of things. And when I read that, I realized, okay, I've also seen those kind of setups as a child, right? There used to be weddings where women from the house would actually cook the food and you would you would have maybe one or two halwai. And I have actually gone to the mandi and procured potatoes and onions and got it for a wedding house, right? So I don't know if you've seen all of that, but in Delhi, that was a very normal thing to see. And when I read all of that, that really helped me in adding that flavor of 1950s in the writing, okay? Like there's a Pandit character and how uh, Pandits used to have all kind of rituals and how they treated uh, a temple and all of that. So... 
a lot of things came to me through that book series which really helped it's that was that that was your inspiration and like your it was my inspiration of, for some scenes i would say that for the nuance for the nuance yeah. yeah yeah for bringing the characters to life yeah yeah and you you do a really good job with that thank um, you yeah and i i'm i'm really enjoying reading this book and i think also what comes through is your personal journey in the research and the process and everything okay yeah and what also comes through is that you are a little bit of a romantic <laughs> and i'm being nice by saying this a little bit is it maybe i'm trying to lead you to believe that through well, a good job <laughs> good thank job thank you thank you do you not do you not resonate with that uh um, theme or that? i i don't know what being a romantic means uh, <laughs> to be i'm a rom- i've been a romance author for almost 15 years now but i'm not <laughs> sure what that term means if you mean that i believe in the idea of uh, finding true love and being madly in love and all that for me love is more about comfort just being able to coexist and being okay with all the odd habits that another person might have rooting for each other and stuff like that that's romance for me i don't know if it's a boring answer <laughs> It's it's not boring at all. I think I think it's something I'm not the that big we are. Guy. I'm not the big gesture guy. I'm, I'm not standing outside anybody's balcony with a radio and with a with guitars and singing a song. I'm not that kind of a guy. The question is, would you like someone to stand outside your balcony and probably sing to you? And... Probably not. Probably not. I prefer you just text me when <laughs> <laughs> when I ask you to text me. So that's more of a <laughs> more of a romance thing for me i love that um, which which actually brings me to a question because you are like i said the entire book is just a series of letters a series of love letters from lovers across the border and how how did you kind of manage to bring that sense of longing um and also that sense of comfort in being able to at least communicate with each other in this time when they were separated quite abruptly how did it bring the comfort yeah cuz a lot of like the letters the it doesn't seem at times that you know they it was all about the struggle i think just maintain being able to maintain some form of connection and like you said right you just want someone to text you yeah. and we we struggle with that yeah. that connection today but your characters make it work when connection was much harder yeah. to form so what i did was i read a lot of real life letters and uh, when you read people's letters you realize that we think of letters in a certain way uh last time i think you probably wrote a letter was when you had an assignment in your english class about write a letter to a friend about explaining your summer vacation yes. trip but patra likhi so when you give the name ki kripya mujhe ek din ka avakash de dijiye that is the idea we have when you think of letters but uh, real letters are very different uh, you try to and a lot of times people write letters where their personality is not coming through but i was trying to write letters where the personality does come through and uh, yeah so that was my idea of zahira and gulab writing letters to each other so did you cuz letter writing like you are saying is an is an art form in itself yes. now yes, yes. right um did you practice writing letters and do you write letters so how i became a writer in a way has uh, something to do with that with letter <laughs> not letters but so when i was in my first year of engineering um i had never been a writer and that was the first time that uh, romance came in my life and uh, at that time you could only write 160 characters in an sms okay and you could only send three sms at a time so basically you could only write 480 characters at a time so my then girlfriend i would just very meticulously utilize and it used to be some 2 rupees per sms so it's costing you 6 rupees to send this 480 Character. So you have to really know you what you want to really say. Ration each character yeah. and plan it, and I would actually plan for eighty characters and write something 
try to say the most I can in those 480 characters because six rupees every every one hour kind of adds up for an engineering student. Mm. So, yeah, so I started writing these SMSs to her and uh, around a week or two into it, she told me that, do you know you write well? Do you know there's more to you than physics? <laughs> Do you know that uh, there are other guys who tried to text me who can't form a sentence and you can write paragraphs? And that was the first moment in my life when it struck me, okay, maybe writing is something I can do. And I asked her that, uh, what do you think I should do with it? And she said, okay, maybe you should write a blog. And those SMSs became a blog and that blog became a book and that one book became seven, eight books and there was a publishing house in the middle and that kind of... Uh, trickled into all of this so I know SMSs are a little different from letters but uh, the the objective is the same right to convey information from one to the other and I think that in a way helped in this book as well yeah I mean th thank you for sharing that story <laughs> how dare you say you're not a romantic <laughs> <laughs> I was at 18 <laughs> well I, so do you do you what is your favorite style of writing? Uh, by style, you mean like format or? Format, yes. Uh, you mean like for screen or for? Right now, I'm writing a web series and I'm really enjoying that. I feel like uh, book writing is a very solitary process compared to other mediums. Um, I've written for TV as well, which is done in a team. And uh, as compared to book writing, for months, you're just sitting on your desk and you have no idea whether you're up to your best work or some absolute garbage. Uh, when you start, you don't know where it's going to finish. Uh, there's financial insecurity when it comes to books for web series and all. Once it is sold, you know, okay, where this is headed. Um, right now, I'm writing a web series and I'm really enjoying the process. It's a light comedy, so the writing process is fun. I keep sharing it with my friends, keep taking their feedback and uh, that's a fun process as well and uh, within a few months we are almost at the stage when the first edit is ready so things move much faster which is great as well okay and um so you know your you your story about your sms love story i knew you love that story i do love that story i do <laughs> it's hard not to it's too endearing i'm sorry um <laughs> do you do you think that love today has changed as a result of our communication styles i think love has changed for a lot of reasons and communication style i feel like dating apps is like a big factor in love changing and how immediate and how available and how fast things are and how many options you have and all that. So, and communication is one aspect of it. Like recently I read a tweet about somebody from somebody that uh, in around two years, dating apps might be obsolete because you just wouldn't know whether you're texting with a person or a bot. Because with the AI, people are already using AI to text people on dating apps. And yeah. within two years... Uh, using chat GPT. Chat to, for text. Imagine if you had chat GPT to type out your SMSs. <laughs> I'd rather not. As a writer, it's a little scary to think of that. For me, my writing is my competitive advantage. So if you commoditize that, hmm. I wouldn't know what to do. But it's still it's still such a unique and creative perspective that I don't think chat GPT or any You mean like texting on a dating app? Um yeah. Yeah. I think it's still I use chat GPT quite regularly. For texting on no, dating not texting apps. on dating app. <laughs> don't give it away. Those, uh, this is gonna Bumble matches with Krishna, so you're being played right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not her coming up with those witty answers. Oh, man. So anyway, back to you. Um, <laughs> ah, of course. No, let's talk. Let's talk about how are you doing, Krishna? <laughs> <laughs> Not on any dating apps oh. with Chat GPT. Is how oh. I'm doing. Okay. But <laughs> but no, I I don't I don't know. Like, are you actually are you actually concerned about you know the the role of AI in the writing space? Because you're your books are very very nuanced and creative, and like you said, you do a lot of research. You have a lot of 
specific research that is very um, focused to the time, the context. And I'm wondering if that, if, if you feel like AI can actually replicate your unique perspective. That's my question. This is the big debate right now. Uh, the term for this is age, AGI. Like, will AI reach the intelligence level and the emotional level of a human being? And the debate right now is, according to me, the debate right now is, it will either happen within, say, next three years, or it will never happen at all. And if it does happen, it's it's really hard to imagine. This is like a this is like a PhD level question that you have asked me, and I'm like a class ten student in this subject, so I really don't know that how far AI will go. I wouldn't say it's impossible that AI can maybe write such nuanced stuff, say five years down the line. Hmm. I I use ChatGPT quite extensively as well, and every day I feel I wake up and I read about whose job has ChatGPT taken over today. Yeah. And uh, it, its applications just blow my mind. Already. What do you use ChatGPT for? I would. That's <laughs> now we're entering personal. trade. No, no, we are entering trade secret <laughs> territory now. Okay, so should we skim over to a lighter topic like the politics? Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but whatever. What to? Um. Well, so would you? Are you thinking of your book becoming? a web series of a film do you think that it cuz it's quite it's quite i don't say filmy but it is a bit <laughs> filmy it's quite filmy and you know i can definitely see, see cinematically when, this having when you say filmy a lot of uh, people believe that what people perceive from that is there is a lot of uh, illogical things happening in the book a lot of people think that but what i believe you mean by filmy is there's a lot of drama in there. That's what I mean. Yeah, not illogical at all. What I mean is there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot there of nuance events. and conflict and yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I was writing the book, I really did imagine it. In the beginning, I thought it might probably be a web series, and uh, at one point, I realized okay, it might make for a very good film. And uh, when I finished the book, I circulated it. I sent it to a lot of people. And uh, some of them, some of the big names as well, actually read the book, and a lot of them really liked the book as well. And uh, we reached out to some OTT platforms, and all of that happened. And uh, there was a big director who really wanted to direct it as well. And um, eventually, we sold the rights to an audio platform as well. And, Incredible! And uh, they have acquired the audio rights of it. And uh, there is probably going to be an audio show on it in some time, but I would also want to see it as a film, maybe. At me too. <laughs> yeah. That's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, be nice. In the beginning, when when I was writing it, I really wanted to make the film myself. Uh, I even imagined uh, like there was this Irishman Kurana film uh, called Gulabo Sitabo, which is based in a very broken kind of a Haveli. I believe they shot it in Lucknow only. I really wanted to take up a Haveli like that and make it into a Hindu refugee camp, uh, which is there in the book, and wanted to direct it myself. Uh, since then, my life has gotten into different directions. So, directing a film is not a priority for me, but uh, I keep getting into those discussions, and I think at some point it might happen. Awesome, and yeah. and the things that happened was your publishing, your publishing yeah. house. Yeah. And so, how did you, how did you decide to make that transition, or to not not necessarily transition because you still write and it's a big part of what you do and who you are, but how did you decide to uh, adopt the publishing game into? So I became a publisher uh, quite early in my. I was just twenty four when I started the publishing company, and uh, I think being a full time writer is like a very bold thing. And it's a life, it's a brave life. <laughs> I sound like a martyr saying that, <laughs> but it's a brave life full of anxiety and uncertainty and stress and all that. And uh, I just think I maybe wasn't ready for doing that full time. And uh, and uh, running a publishing house alongside writing, uh, it just sounded like the right thing to do at that time. And thank God I did that. I'm so glad I did that because. 
being a full time writer is a tough job. I I know a lot of full time writers, and it's a tough life. Yeah, and but publishing is quite competitive as well. And so, what has that business been like for you? I feel like I've seen like extreme highs and extreme lows as well. Um, it's been what eleven, twelve years now since I started, and uh, the good years we started with a bang. A lot of our books just took off. I mean, if they reached you, I made money of. uh you f- being a college student probably at that time so yeah uh school student at school student yeah. so you made money of my parents i'm sounding really old right now <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so started with a bang then a few quiet years and during the pandemic we kind of went global and uh, started exporting a lot of stuff which really worked well for us And how are you? How are you able to switch between the role of writer and publisher? Uh, right now, uh, how I view it is that publisher is taking the center stage right now, and uh, whenever I have a free window or whatever, so that's when I don the writing hat. Okay. Publishing is kind of in a sweet spot, so that's what I'm focusing on mostly yeah. right now. Okay. and you you get to obviously work with a bunch of other writers and that could be you know quite motivating as well it's, it's fun yeah it's fun it's more fun than locking yourself in your room and just being with your laptop trying to come up with ideas for yourself yeah and do you have a preference or for... between writing and publishing oh uh, right now i'm balancing both and i'm really enjoying both to be honest uh, both have very different objectives both have very different place in my life so yeah right now it's really 50-50 so coming back to your inspiration um which is a word that i know i've used a lot but i would really like to know more about your trip to pakistan and because you said that there were so many stories that happened and a lot that kind of changed your perspective on multiple fronts and i'd love to hear more about that i got into a lot of uh, conversations in uh, pakistan and uh, this was a little before things went really downhill uh, between india and pakistan i think uh, when i met people there there was a lot of love for india I think in today's world of social media and uh, Arnab Goswami things might be a little different because I when I talk to my friends in Pakistan I do hear that people are watching these uh, really toxic videos of uh, people uh, talking about Pakistan in such a bad light and uh, like for example uh, one of the conversations I had I think in Lahore was uh i was on a three city visa in pakistan when you go there uh, so i had uh, karachi islamabad and lahore visa and uh, how i had ended up in pakistan was because i had met certain media people in india which used to be fairly common a lot of pakistani people could easily get an indian visa until 5 6 years back uh, pakistani actors were acting in uh, hindi movies which sounds so distant and so unreal right now Pakistan used to play cricket in Chennai and Bangalore and all which sound like a distant memories if there's somebody if somebody is say, say 18 year old today they would have no memory of watching Pakistani players playing cricket in India alongside yeah. not against alongside and not against even against. against like i think the last time pakistan played cricket in india might have been 2011 world cup or maybe 2013 14 is my guess uh So uh yeah so when i landed there one of the question one of the common man on the road asked me was that uh he had some family visit india and uh, whenever his relatives would tell anybody that they are from pakistan they would be viewed very suspiciously which is our view uh, which is the view of a lot of common people in india and uh, he asked me this that why does this happen that why are indian people so skeptical when we here in pakistan offer so much love which i saw myself as well which i can confirm happen there is love yeah there is love so uh, yeah and i really didn't have an answer that why does this happen that's 
these are just forces beyond my comprehension or control that uh, these things just happened so yeah i mean if i go today uh, people would have maybe specific instances or specific videos they've seen of indian media talking about them in a certain way so yeah these things just happen i guess yeah and i i it is it is saddening that yeah. the sentiment has you know men have deteriorated uh, uh, yeah. so drastically yeah like another conversation i had was uh, so i'm an atheist so uh, i told somebody that i'm an atheist and uh, it was as if his whole world view shook on hearing that they had a lot of people there had no comprehension of this concept that what is atheism and how can somebody be atheist and they asked me that okay so if you're atheist how do you think where do you think we came from who do you think created us and i said evolution <laughs> and they were they looked at me like what is this idiot how how does he like you think we came from monkeys so they are, yeah it was like a brain wave for them that somebody can have such a view towards the world but at least at least they were accepting that that you have that world view uh they were they were but maybe there might be some other people who would be like this guy has lost his mind that can be the case as well so the partition is obviously the central theme of your book and has been a theme of many many books and stories and you know i have to ask what is your what is your take on it see i think one aspect of partition that uh, a lot of people forget is like i read about the partition in my history book and it said that partition of india happened on 15th of august 1947 but what i got to know as i was re- researching uh, this book is that there were families which were stuck in the partition for decades and decades the st- the whole story of my book is about a guy who's stuck in pakistan for around 15 odd years after the partition trying with his whole soul trying to come back to india and gulam ali limfitter is uh, one such guy there were like thousands of people who went through similar stories and i believe you're sindhi i am so i i'm sure you have a family story your producer is punjabi so i'm sure he has a story yeah. and uh, uh one of the concepts one of the lines i read somewhere is that partition of india is actually happening today as well it's really happening it's 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 always been happening whenever uh, our government assigns 5% of the budget to defense to fight the kashmir conflict instead and gives only 2% to healthcare and 1% to education these are just made up numbers i'm throwing but when you spend money on the kashmir issue uh, defense budget rather than development things so that is still partition happening as of today when when people in pa- parts of pakistan don't get to visit their family when people in rajasthan don't get to visit their family that's still partition happening as of today so i believe it's not a one day event it's a continuous event which is still on mm-hmm. and mo- moving forward for the future you are you are obviously you know influential in in this space and what would you i have really no i just what? <laughs> fine we can edit that huh? <laughs> no but well, no no you go what would what is your hope for the future generations of this country the way they you know would think about india pakistan relationship uh, i believe uh, atul bihari vajpayee was on a good track uh, i believe he did take a lot of concrete steps at that time i believe we did get betrayed by our neighbor i wouldn't say that it's all been good from their side they've done some very dark stuff as well i'm not trying to say that there's nothing bad happening from their side but uh, i don't know i mean uh, do i believe that we ever reach resolution of that conflict i don't see that happening but in an ideal world who's stopping us from dreaming so why not yes and 
do you have any uh, so you said you're working on a web series that's slightly lighter comedic mm-hmm. um do you have any idea of when you would want to write your next book i'm on a break right now and i'm really enjoying the break i keep meeting interesting people and coming across interesting stories which makes it very difficult uh, for uh, me to not write but uh, you're compelled <laughs> yeah i mean i think every month i meet one person in fact when i met you i kept thinking that okay a dating coach in bombay is i mean that's a very good premise for a for a book so it kept coming to my mind at that time as well but if only what i do wasn't extremely confidential <laughs> i'm sure we can fictionalize and change character traits and make something work or maybe this some client from 10 years ago who's yeah. maybe beyond that confidentiality agreement <laughs> so yeah it takes a lot of energy to not start writing another book but it's going to remain like that for a bit this is something that i've come across in a lot of writers is your constant open mindedness and open to stories open to conflict even which has such a you know great role to play in the way you deal with conflict i think we are more uh, non judgmental and more receptive to world views very different different from us like if i meet somebody we might be different like when i speak to my school friends for example and uh, some of them have very rigid world views even say politically if you don't believe if you don't share their world view you could end up getting into a real argument but when i meet my creative friends here in bombay they are like oh you murdered somebody that's all right you must have had your reasons there there are <laughs> i can list 10 good reasons to murder somebody that's all right okay so yeah i mean we are just very open people and how do you stay open minded i think uh, in my case um, i've been lucky to have had a lot of different experiences uh i've not been in a job since 2011 uh and as a result of that i just keep floating around i keep finding myself in rooms like this one like in a very different room every other week i keep exposing myself to different kind of experiences so the more you expose yourself the more you get to know and quit your job quit your i i uh, i'm not against doing a job but i'll tell you why it helps to not be in a job is because when you do a job a chunk of your time is uh, dedicated to a similar environment right yeah like I, like for last few months i felt like i want to live in london for no reason i just want to live in london and see how it feels to live in london so i just booked my tickets for next month and i'm just going to live in london for a month and do nothing and just see how it feels to live in london yeah and i want to do that in new york as well at some point just see how it feels mm-hmm. and do some random course and meet some people and work out of a cafe sitting in new york and meet some people who are different and think differently and that's the hope yeah let's see i'm i'm bad at starting conversations with strangers so who knows let's see so as a publisher yeah um in in a time where books have somewhat taken like we it's pe- the way people read books and consume content has changed so drastically how has that affected the publishing business um and what do you see as the future of publishing see uh, wherever you talk to somebody I, i keep hearing that nobody around us seems to be reading books but if you actually see the industry numbers they are actually growing people are actually reading more so how did this rumor get started that nobody is reading i think uh, we forget that uh, when we were younger people were reading even lesser <laughs> so i think we had that romantic we saw somebody read once and uh, we were like yeah people used to read in library period everybody used to read that means people were readers but uh, if you talk to an average 12 year old now they would have read say 20 books by age 12 uh, when i was age 12 i had read one sherlock holmes outside curriculum and my niece uh, who is 11 and she's like a book a week kind of a person so she's like a 
prolific reader so people are reading people are reading just that uh, there are lot more people writing as well so there are a lot of people who tried writing and couldn't sell any books and then they told thousand people that i wrote a book and nobody read it so that world also that's super interesting because it is like there are also a lot of companies that help you get self published yeah, yeah and that's the whole industry out there yeah absolutely. i to be honest i also explored that as a business should i do that but i thought that it's just so difficult to make meet people's expectations in that business model that i just backed out from that so can you explain a fundamental difference between that business model and yours Uh, self publishing is when people pay to get published they pay say i think anywhere between 15000 to around 2 lakhs to get your book out on amazon and maybe some bookstores as well and traditional publishing is when the publisher invests in your book because they believe in the book and they put it on amazon and bookstores and all that um we are in a third model where we just create our own content mostly with my team and we just list it on Amazon and all those platforms and somehow they seem to be doing well um and and where do you see this business model progressing in the future How the one that we are going? working on yes i think uh, it's a good space to be in it's one of the lower ai threatened business models as well I I think if you're starting in a, a a content business in today's time that AI is a real threat no matter what you're doing it seems to be replaced by AI right now but uh, I believe we are in a good space I think uh, this is going to just grow and grow mm-hmm. okay and um I'm struggling to stay away from the AI debate because I feel like I think it's my favorite that. topic right now. <laughs> Every morning I wake up and read about five new AI tools and I just love it. And now I'm maintaining a database. Okay, these are the AI tools in case I need it. Yeah. I believe every organization should hire an AI coach right now just to make sure how many operations you can do better with AI. So do you see AI playing a role in your business in the future? I it already does in a lot of ways. Uh we are using ai for like say editing a book or grammar checking it and stuff like that okay suppose you have a page and you want to make sure it's anything in the creative process um uh, not really i believe currently gpt4 uh, is more at an execution stage i don't think you can use it uh, to actually we did now that i think about it i'll give you uh, an example so we were brainstorming for a horror teenage high school book series okay uh, kind of like you used to have goosebumps and all that like you had hardy boys for crime and you had uh, sweet valley high for romance so we were trying to do high school horror and we were brainstorming for the title of the series for half an hour and we couldn't come up with anything so i picked up chat gpt and i asked it that can you come up with title idea for such and such and such and it came up with nightmare high and i was like this is better than any ideas we came up with nightmare high is like the ideal name for this series i mean and is it was just a freaky moment for us in the writers room that okay this is really better than what we could come up with so that happens yeah okay that's cool and it, it does that does that excite you or scare you or a little bit of both i think uh, as a writer it scares me as a publisher it excites me so as a publisher it just makes me capable of doing so much more yeah so yeah really and what what content or tv shows are you currently enjoying books uh i'm more of a reader mm-hmm. i'm uh, not much of a watcher i think we are a dying breed right now everybody is more of a watcher i'm reading uh, the god delusion by richard dawkins Okay. It's coming back to atheism as a theme. Um so I believe uh, there's very little discussion happening around atheism and there's very little there are very few resources for me to kind of understand like if suppose if you're uh, say a Hindu or a Christian there are a lot of uh, gurus or there's a lot of literature that you can read and there are a lot of podcasts also talking about all of that. as an atheist there is not much so i came across this book and it's a very rational approach 
to religion or the lack of it and really enjoying it right now. Okay. Thanks for sharing. And do you have any advice for people who are trying to get into this space, um, you know, in the writing and publishing space? For writing, I would say uh, just write a lot and don't publish all of it. Just write a lot and uh, get your friends and everybody to read it, get feedback, then use that feedback or discard that feedback, and you, but use it to get a better at the craft of writing. I'm a big believer in volume. Do a lot. Don't put out all of it, but do a lot. It's the doing which will make you better. So hone your skill. Hone your skill, yeah. Okay. That's my advice to writers. As publisher, I really don't know. I believe uh, we've made it because we've just stuck at it for 11, 12 years. But uh, starting today as a publisher sounds like a scary idea. Why? Uh, it's a cluttered industry if you don't have anything built right now. I would just say uh, you'll need to find really good content. And if you don't have experience, I don't know how you will find really good content. But you really need to find really good content, which is pretty much true for every content-based business, right? And how do you find content? How do you specifically find content? I'm just, I'm a writer myself, so I have judgment over what is good content, what is not. And uh, because of because I'm a publisher, I also have access to a lot of distributors, retailers, a lot of global distributors, and I follow publishing trends very closely. And I have access to all that data and that information and that network because I've been doing it for so long. But if I was starting today, I would really not know where to begin. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> And uh, for for those of you who are watching and listening, please buy his book. It was it's called Hindu Refugee Camp Lahore. Yeah, got very good reviews. Yeah, and <laughs> and and um, it is it is a great read. And yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you for writing it. And I'm excited about the web series, yeah. which is an animated web series. Do you have a name for that yet? Or are we waiting for Chat GPT I, to? <laughs> I started with the name. Okay. Uh, I have a name, but it'll take time for me to share. To that. share? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, um, really looking forward I'm to it. I'm trying to get a tattoo of the name on my wrist. Really? That's how much I love the name. That's how much. <laughs> really love the name. Okay. Well, when it when it gets out. Maybe I'll reveal it with my tattoo. That's a good idea. Yeah. Well, A um, picture of my wrist with a tattoo will be the title boy, reveal of boy. my web series. That could be fun. Run it by your social media guy first. Yeah, he's, I run by everything. Yeah. By him. All right, well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to come and talk to us. Thank you so much for having me. It was great fun.